in our community groups uh, in person, but you just think about, man, us being able to worship together like this, I mean, it's something that hopefully we can all treasure uh, as we worship together. And, um, and so let's, let's worship. Let's worship today. Um, at Living Faith, we like to start our call to worship by reading from the psalm. Uh, we like to have the psalms lead us into uh, the right sort of mindset, uh, to have the right sort of expectations as we worship God. And so if you could turn in your Bibles to Psalm 36, we'll read this by alternating verses. And, and if you're able, please stand as, as we read this together. And if you need uh, another copy of a bulletin, it's also available on the website. So you can also pull it up on your phones uh, if you prefer uh, to view it that way. Uh, but let's read Psalm 36, verses 1 through 12. And we'll read this responsively where I read verse 1. Uh, you'll read verse 2. We'll go back and forth and read the last verse together. But Psalm 36, let's begin our worship by reading from God's Word. Psalm 36, transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He has, caught, he has ceased to act wisely and do good. He plots trouble all on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not reject you. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains, God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast, you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who do know you, and your righteousness to the upright of heart. Let not the foot of arrogance come upon me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. And together... There the evildoers lie fallen. They are thrust down, unable to rise. You know, you think about just what we just read, and, you know, you think about how we relate to evil, uh, how we relate uh, to God. I mean, this psalm is, is having us consider these things. And God's steadfast love uh, comes up over and over in this psalm. And, and my hope and prayer for us as we're worshiping God is that we could, as this psalm said, take refuge in the shadow of God's wings. Under, in his refuge, receive his steadfast love today. And my hope and prayer is that we can do that together. Uh, let me pray for us as we uh, begin our worship together. Father, we come before you, Lord, and we even confess that, that there are times when we have no fear, no reverence for you. And yet, Lord God, even in those times, even in those seasons, Lord God, we read here of your steadfast love. And Lord God, even in those seasons, your steadfast love, it meets us where we are and it draws us to yourself. And so, Lord, as we worship you, wherever we might be, wherever our hearts might be, oh Lord, help us to receive your steadfast love and help us, Lord, to once again to be changed by your steadfast love for us in Jesus Christ. And as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, we also pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. See who breaks the power. And who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. And who 
shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings oh this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you would lay down your life that i would be set free oh jesus i sing for all that you've done for me Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. No, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. No, you would lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And worthy is the King who conquers the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And worthy is the King who conquers the grave. Oh, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Oh, worthy, worthy. Worthy, oh, and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord, and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. And it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. And so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. And so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. And so we pour out our praise to you only. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life 
that I would be set free. No, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Your grace and your grace is enough more than I need. At your word I will believe and I'll wait for you. Draw near again. Let your spirit make me new and I will fall at your feet. Yes, I will fall at your feet and I will worship you here in your presence in me Jesus light the way and by the power of your word I am restored, I am redeemed, by your Spirit I am free, and I will fall at your feet, yes I will fall at your feet, and I will worship you here sing freely you gave oh freely you gave it all for us surrendered your life upon that cross and great is the love and poured out for all this is our God Oh, lift it on high from death to life. Forever our God is glorified. Our servant and king, you rescued the world. This is our God. Can we sing freely you gave? And oh, freely you gave. It all for us surrendered your life upon that cross. And great is the love I'm poured out for all. This is our God. And oh, lift it on high from death to life. Forever our God is glorified. Our servant and king, you rescued the world. This is our God. Let me, let me, Faith, please pray with me. God in heaven, we gather here in this parking lot in the name of your son, Jesus. We lift up this prayer to you. With hearts that are knit together by the amazing grace and mercy we have received by your costly sacrifice at Calvary's cross. We thank you for you not only rule and reign over this world and universe, you do so even over our own hearts. But Lord, our hearts are so prone to wander, to go astray like sheep. We neglect your word, our daily bread, that points us to the finished work of Christ, and we fail to appropriate this truth to our own detriment. And unwittingly, we weaken your body here on earth. We, I, have been quick to judge, 
criticize others, and even slander those for whom you died and are precious in your sight. By our actions and inactions, we have grieved your spirit by being wise in our own eyes and sowing seeds of division rather than unity. We allow the news rather than your good news to shape our outlook and attitude. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Whether it's seven times in one day for the same offense, have mercy. Forgive us, we repent. Thank you, Jesus, that you take the weight of the world off our shoulders, and you took all the weight of sin and misery upon your shoulders on the cross. You bore the holy wrath and punishment of sin as our Passover lamb. Holy Spirit, fill us with joy and freedom in the gospel. Remind us how truly amazing Christ's grace is. Cast out all fear and anxiety. May we take heart and cry with the psalmist. May we cry, behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. May we be a community of faith that is known for loving you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that is known for constantly forgiving one another. Help us to heed your words, Lord Jesus, that by our love for one another, all people will know that we are your disciples. As a right, rightful response to the gospel, may we pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. We lift up baby Jeremy as he has relapsed into bouts with his seizures. We appeal to you, Jesus, the great physician, to restore him, heal him. Give Hojin and Lisa strength to persevere and trust you in all things. We pray for uh, Phil's mom and James's father as they battle cancer. Grace's father and Matt's mother for their health. Holy Spirit, strengthen them, mind, body, and soul to hope in you. Heal them, Lord. Be gracious to them. And all of us here and now who need healing from depression, anxiety, and the futile pursuit of anything but you. Lord Jesus, as we hear your word preached, as we address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to you with our hearts, as we partake in communion, in this parking lot, give us a taste of heaven. Give us a preview of the eternal rest that is to come. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Restore unto us the joy of your salvation. Come, Lord Jesus, we ask all of this in your powerful name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. And at any point, um, if you're finding yourself in the sun and you need to move, uh, feel free to move at any point during the service. Uh, but we're in a sermon series, right? And maybe before we get into God's Word, just a, a real quick announcement is that uh, we have that prayer meeting that we do on a monthly basis. That's happening this Wednesday. And so again, you can find that link to join uh, on our website. Um, and we'll also send out an email for you guys uh, a little bit later uh, this week. But if you can join us, that would be great as we pray together, not only for one another, but even for the church and for the world. And so hopefully you can join us for our prayer meeting this Wednesday. Uh, but we're in a sermon series uh, called The Lord Reigns. Uh, we've been in a sermon series called The Lord Reigns, and we've been looking at different psalms so that we could better understand what that means, what our response to that truth should look like. And, and we think about just everything that's going on uh, with a pandemic, with everything else that's maybe not even happening uh, during this pandemic. Man, we need this sort of truth this sort of unchanging truth that the Lord reigns to impact us, right? To comfort us, to inspire us. And so as we turn to Psalm 96, I'm going to read this, this entire chapter for us. Psalm 96. So please turn with me there if you have your Bibles. And even once again, if you're able, um, out of reverence for God's word, let's, let's stand once again um, as we hear God speak to us through his word. Psalm 96. I'll read all 13 verses for us here. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. 
He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord comes. Before the Lord, for he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Amen. Please be seated. And let me pray for us. Father, we, we need your Holy Spirit to really impress this truth upon our hearts, and, and even as we read and heard from your word, Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to move us, to compel us to sing, uh, to rejoice in light of this truth. And so, Lord, for those of us who have uh, suffering hearts, Lord God, we just pray that through your word that we might be comforted. Lord God, for those of us who have weary hearts, Oh, Lord God, help us to be strengthened. Oh, Lord God, if we have drifting or even unbelieving hearts, oh, Lord God, help us to be awakened as we hear from you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, you, know, you think about Election Day being in, in two days. I would imagine that you probably received and probably inundated with all sorts of mailers, right? Not only at the national level, but the state at the local level. Uh, you're probably seeing all, all these ads everywhere. Um, you're seeing it on TV. You're probably hearing it on the, on the radio or on podcasts all the time. And one of the things that we're, we're seeing is that candidates and people, they're trying to set themselves apart, aren't they, from others uh, during this political sort of season. People are trying to set themselves apart from the other candidates on the ballot. Uh, even in the world of sports, right, you think about this concept of being set apart. You know, you think about all these teams competing uh, to be basically set apart and to be crowned as champions, right? And I'm proud to say that this year it was the Lakers and the Dodgers being set apart. Uh, and this whole language about being set apart, if you look to the Bible, the Bible actually uses that sort of language whenever it talks about something being holy. That something is holy, the Bible is saying that it is set apart, that he or she is set apart. And the Bible talks about God being holy, doesn't it? About God being set apart. And as we think about the greatness of who God is, about how set apart God is, and that's what the psalm has us consider, it begs us to respond in at least these three ways, to, to, to praise God. As we think about how holy, how set apart God is, we see from the psalm that he is to be praised. Uh, we see, secondly, that he's to be worshipped. But we also see that he's to be declared, right? That if we think about this truth, about God being holy, so set apart, he's completely other than anything in all of creation. If we think about that truth, the psalm is saying that he is then to be praised. He is to be worshipped. That he is to be declared to others. And so let's take a look at the psalm. You know, it uses language, right, like sing, to bless his name, to ascribe to the Lord, to give it up to God, the things that do his name. To be glad, to rejoice. And, and you think about how the psalm talks about this. And he's not just talking about individual people to do this. He's not just talking about Christians in the church uh, to do this. But it says all the earth, doesn't it? That God is so great. That God is so set apart that all the earth should praise his name. That that's how elevated and great God is. And why is that? And, and there's so many things that we can talk about from the psalm about why we should praise God. But I want us to, to focus in on this one key phrase in verse 9. 
And it's this phrase, the splendor of holiness. As we think about how set apart God is, I want us to think about this phrase, the splendor. You can even interpret that to mean the beauty of how set apart, about how great God is, that there is a splendor and beauty to God. And that's one of the things that we really do need to understand, right? If you think about what it means to be a Christian, about what it means to, to follow God, to know the God of the Bible, we need to understand the splendor and beauty of who God is. And I would imagine that various people, when they hear that phrase, they think about their own personal experiences. Uh, it can even be their circumstances. It could be different sort of setbacks and sufferings that you experience. And you think about splendor and beauty. Like, man, do you understand how hard my life is, what I've gone through? I don't see splendor. I don't see beauty. You, you think of God being more maybe even cruel or at best indifferent, right? Splendor and beauty, what are you talking about? Uh, you think about even maybe poor examples of God's representatives, right? Back in the day in the Bible, they have religious leaders called Pharisees. They were poor examples, claiming that they were leading and following God uh, in the name of God. And you think about what sort of examples they were to people. They were not compassionate. They were condescending, weren't they? Uh, they weren't humble. They were so prideful, so self-righteous. And so we think about the splendor and beauty of who God is, and sometimes we can be deterred or even hindered, right, by what's going on in our lives or what we see happening even outside or what people are doing in the name of the Lord, in the name of God. But let's look at God's Word and see how are we supposed to understand the splendor, the beauty of God's holiness. And, you know, you look at God's Word and you look elsewhere in places like Isaiah and Revelation, it says that God is not just holy, but we see angels singing to God, holy, 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 right? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so we're thinking about how set apart is he? You know, you, you describe someone being holy once, that can be descriptive. You say someone is holy, holy, now you're talking about a superlative, but the fact that the Bible talks about God, about who God is being holy, 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 that intensifies the superlative. We're saying that he is completely other. As creator, he is above and more majestic, has more splendor and beauty than all of creation. And I want you to think about that. There are many beautiful, not only people, but there are many beautiful things that you could see and experience in this world. And what the Bible is saying is that God is so set apart so holy that he is far and infinitely more beautiful than the most beautiful person or thing or experience that you can have in creation, in all of creation. Now, you would think that having this sort of God being that beautiful, being that holy, that set apart, that that makes God unknowable maybe or unapproachable. But this is what makes God so beautiful, right? Not just holy and set apart, but what makes God so beautiful is that even though he's that high and that almighty, he comes down and meets us where we are, right? He comes down to meet us where we are, and we get a glimpse of just how beautiful God is, just even by the laws that he's revealed in God's word. You know, you think about what our natural impulses are. Without God's word, if you just let people be, I mean, the natural impulse, and the Bible would say even a sinful one, would be, you know what? Use others, manipulate others for your own gain, right? The stronger, the more powerful, that they can take advantage of those who are not. And that's the natural impulse that we see, even in the animal kingdom, right? But what does God's law say? It makes God beautiful because he says, no, don't use others, but man, bless others to live, to love and serve others, even if it's at your own expense, I mean, that's the kind of beauty of who God is. Even as we look at the kind of laws that he's revealed in God's word, do you think about our natural impulse to ignore and neglect the poor? I mean, I'm guilty of that too, right? I mean, if you live in L.A., if you live in any sort of uh, city or urban area, you're going to pass homeless people. How easy is it to drive past them, to ignore them, uh, to act like they don't even exist, right? That they're invisible. That's the natural impulse. 
to do that for the poor, to do that to the immigrant, uh, to do that to the incarcerated, to the weak, to the elderly. I mean, the natural impulse is to overlook and to neglect them. But God says what? Man, love on them, defend them, advocate for them. And, And that makes God beautiful, doesn't it? Like, as you think about God's laws, that this is who God is. But if that wasn't enough, the beauty of God is that God came down into this world, didn't he? He could have just simply given us his laws, and we would have been like, there there is no God like this. There is no lawgiver like this uh, commanding us to live in this sort of way. But if that wasn't enough, the Bible says that God came into this world, right? He entered our sufferings, not simply so that he could sympathize and understand us better. No, but so that he can save us from it, even at his own expense. And we see that in the person of Jesus, right? We see not only the holiness, the the otherness of Jesus when he lived and walked this earth, but we see the beauty of who Jesus is. We think about how Jesus, how he totally gave of himself. He served, even at his own expense, uh, those around him. You think about him washing the disciples' feet. And knowing that Judas would betray him, he even washed Judas' feet. I mean, that's a whole another different kind of world, kind of principle and kind of living, right? You think about how Jesus walked and didn't just simply help those who were strong or didn't simply help those who can help themselves. But no, he helped and loved and ministered to the poor, the sick, even the Gentiles. Right? Those who were not Jewish. He didn't stick simply to his own tribe. We think about even how Jesus, he could have come into this world with his angels, with his posse, right, if you will. And he could have come to destroy all of his enemies. But we think about the beauty of who God is in Jesus Christ, and we see that Jesus came not to destroy his enemies, but to love his enemies by even dying for them, by dying for you and me, right? We were once his enemies. And yet God in the person of Jesus came to die even for his enemies, to save even his enemies. This is what makes God who he is, right? This is the splendor. Uh, This is the beauty of God's holiness. And, And this is why the psalm says he is to be praised. But if you think about how this truth changes us, it it doesn't just move and compel us to praise God more. But what something or someone is set apart and has so much splendor, has so much beauty, that praise will give birth to something greater, right? If you have something or someone that's so beautiful and you want to treasure it, you elevate it, don't you? Uh, You don't keep it mixed with all the other things, with all your other belongings, but there's something that you treasure that you're constantly praising because you enjoy it so much, I mean, you elevate it. And praise, if it's about the object of our praise being, it has splendor, it has beauty, it's going to give birth to worship. That's what we see in our passage too. And that's what we see even in our own lives, right? This isn't just something we see in the Bible. Things that we love and enjoy so much, we end up moving and worshiping that thing. We give ourselves to that thing or to that someone. Praise has and worship has this sort of effect. And, and the Bible will say, and we see this in verse 4, that great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared. Above all gods, it says, that he is to be feared. And again, the Bible, when it says, uses this sort of language about fearing God, it's not just talking about being, af- about being afraid of God. It's talking about having this reverential awe and wonder about who God is, right? About being drawn to God, not being drawn away from God. About being drawn to God. And the Bible will say that it's not about if you worship God or something else, but what or whom you worship, right? Because we're all praising something. Uh, All of us, as we're living our lives, we're drawn to worship. If it's not going to be God, someone or something else. And And this is something that we need to all slow down and even ask ourselves and examine what's going on even in in our own hearts and in our own lives. Is during this pandemic, in light of everything that's going on right now, what do you find yourself wanting to praise, right? Is there something that's missing that you're wishing that you could praise and rejoice about more? 
Or is there anything that's happening in your life right now that you're being drawn to praise? And that sometimes gives you an idea, right, of are we moving and drawing closer to God or, 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 or being driven further away? You think about during this pandemic, is, is there anything that has been threatened or, again, even taken away so that the way that you're responding to that is, is, is you're getting more angry or upset? A lot of whatever's going on right now, do you, do you feel shaken? Feel like life is falling apart? Like, like you feel like you're, you're getting crushed because something is being threatened or taken away? When we think about those questions, we're trying to get to the object of worship in our hearts. And we all have these various objects, right? None of, no one is perfect where we're only worshiping God. We have, for, I mean, for so many people, gods, right, that we're being drawn to, that we're wanting to praise, that we're wanting to trust, uh, that we're wanting to serve, that we're wanting things from. And, and just to give us a few examples, I, I thought about even in my own heart what's being exposed, because this is a question, right, like what's being exposed in your heart? The Bible will say that the circumstances reveal what's in your heart, right? And I'm asking myself, what's being revealed in my own heart during this time? And I'm realizing that what's being exposed and revealed is this idol or this desire to have control, not simply about my circumstances, but over my emotional life, right? I feel like during this time that even in my own heart, that the emotional stability that I thought that I once, maybe it's the illusion of it, uh, that I thought that I had pre-pandemic, it's getting threatened, right? And it's not the children's fault. I mean, they're, they're going through their own things. I mean, having three kids, we're doing, and so many of us are doing the remote distance learning at this time. Uh, we're both working from home. I mean, there's so many things that you can't control in light of what's happening day to day. And what I'm finding in myself is I'm losing the control over my emotional life that I'm getting riled up, that, that there are times when I'm not pleasant to be around at home. There's this, this, this idol of, of control that's being threatened uh, even in my own heart during this time. I mean, what is it for you? Right? Is it money? Is that being threatened? Uh, what is it? Is it even the sense of, of personal fulfillment that all the different hobbies or the different sort of things that you enjoy doing, are those being taken away so that you feel like, man, this journey of wanting to be a better version of myself, that I'm not able to pursue those things, is that being threatened? You know, I was watching um, Free Solo the other day. It's a documentary about, um, what was his name, um, Alex Honnold. Someone who wanted to free climb El Capitan in Yosemite. And this was after we watched the Don Wall. And it was so interesting that for him, climbing this wall without ropes, it was so important to him. I mean, he even talked about having this free solo mentality, right? Where you give of yourself 100% to something. And for Alex Honnold, for him, it was giving himself 100% of himself to this climb. Even if it could mean him dying right? Every single one of us, we have something going on in our hearts. And what God is saying is that all the gods, this is in verse 5, right? He says, all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. And what God is saying is that they are worthless because they are counterfeits to the real thing. All these things that we're wanting to, to, to be better, more fulfilled, to be more happy, in this life, if it's not God, it's going to keep asking more of us. It's going to keep asking us to give more of ourselves to it. And, and we're not going to be happy. That even as we give more of ourselves to it, that we're going to be more tired. We're going to feel emptier. The Bible is saying that if you keep giving yourselves to counterfeit things, it's going to leave you and put you in a place where you're even more hopeless. We were meant to worship the God who made the heavens. We were meant to worship the real thing and not counterfeits. We were meant to worship the God who made us. This is the sort of God that we have. This is the sort of splendor and beauty of who God is, and we are being 
by the Spirit, hopefully moved to worship this God. But lastly, we see in the psalm that this God is to not only be praised and worshipped, but to be declared. And it says, among the nations, among all peoples. I mean, if you just peruse, kind of take this brief overview, this, this glimpse over this entire psalm, in verse 2 it talks about telling of his salvation from day to day. It says to say among the nations in verse 10 that the Lord reigns, that he's coming to judge. If you think about the splendor and the beauty of what we're supposed to declare to others, we're saying this thing, that there is a judge, that there is a king, that there is a creator, that there is a savior, and this savior is Jesus. That that's what we're called to declare through our words. You think about what Paul says in Acts 17. He talks about how he, God calls all people everywhere to repent and how he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. And, and, and pay attention right here. It says, by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. If you think about the good news of, of why we live as Christians the way that we do, what we're really striving to declare, we're saying, man, the person who's going to one day judge all the earth is actually the same person. It's the Savior. It's going to be Jesus. And everyone's going to be judged. The question is, what's the verdict going to be based on? Right? Everyone's going to be judged. But what's the basis of the verdict? And the question is, is it going to be on the basis of how well you lived your life? Or is it going to be based on how well Jesus lived his life in your place? And that's the beauty and the splendor of who God is, isn't it? That he's provided his own son to be, to live that perfect life in our place, to die the death in our place. And there's splendor and beauty there. You know, and God promises in Romans 8, right, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus this is a kind of splendor and beauty that you can't find anywhere else. There is no good news that comes to us concerning salvation that's better than this. But it's not simply just in our words, right? We're not simply called to declare how beautiful God is in our words, but it's also in how we're living. And maybe it's during these times when things are so polarized that as Christians that we need to really think about what does it mean to even engage on various issues as a Christian, right? I think we're living in a time when, when the, the way that the camps are kind of split is that you're either a conservative, evangelical Republican, or you're going to be a progressive, liberal Democrat, right? And those are the kind of lo the, the, the camps, and the way that these things are being defined. But if you think about how Christians are supposed to think about the way that we're supposed to engage these various issues, it's just not one in, in one or two of these camps, right? You think about how the Christian is supposed to think. We're, we're called to commit to spreading and declaring the splendor and the beauty of who God is by not only advocating for the mother, but also for the unborn child. It's an and kind of dilemma. It's not an either or. For Christians, we're called to advocate and to love on not only the mother, but also the unborn child. Where we're thinking about how can we support and love both. How can we be advocates for even adoption, right? Even as we advocate and go against abortion. Like, how can we do both? How can we as Christians not simply fall into these predetermined sort of camps, but how can we be for the poor, for the oppressed, for the incarcerated? How can we care about the environment but also be maybe labeled Republican, right? It's an and sort of dilemma for Christians, and for, for all of us, as we think about this, it's not easy, right? As we think about declaring the splendor and beauty of who God is to others, not only in our words, but also in how we live, how we, we engage others, how we engage those who differ from us, it's going to be hard. But there is a splendor and beauty in who God is that makes that possible. You know, one day when Christ returns, all people, all nations will give praise, will exult, will rejoice, to see in the fields and everything in it. But friends, uh, brothers and sisters, can we consider 
how we can partake and do some of that now. Not wait until Jesus returns, but can we consider how we can praise and worship and declare the splendor and beauty of who God is to others now? That's my hope and prayer, that we can do that not only individually, but collectively as a church. Let's pray. Father, we, we confess that, that often we can know things about who you are, but our hearts are not moved to give you praise. Uh, Lord God, we could talk about worshiping you, and even through singing of song and even attending an outdoor service, Lord, we could go through the forms of worship, but Lord, in our hearts, oh, we need your Holy Spirit to draw us and, 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 and even have us compelled and inspire to give more of ourselves to you in worship, uh, in declaring to others about who you are. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask that during this pandemic, that in the various circumstances that we all find ourselves in, Holy Spirit, won't you help us to do that faithfully, purposefully, and intentionally during this time. We ask this in the powerful and precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. of just partaking of the Lord's Supper again today. And, you know, we think about just this visible picture, right, of, 
of who God is, uh, about what he's done in love uh, for us, uh, we see the splendor and beauty, don't we, of what sort of God that we praise and we worship, that we want to declare to others. And, and we see a broken body. Uh, we see a blood shed. And, and those are the things that we need to be considering as we partake. Um, we like to, a living faith, repent and believe together. The scriptures call us to examine ourselves before we partake. And so here we like to repent and believe together. And in your bulletins, you'll notice that there is a prayer of repentance um, that's, that's included there. And I'd like for us to be able to pray this together out loud and then have it lead us into a private and silent time of prayer. And so if you could turn there, let's, let's pray this together. And again, we'll have it to lead us into a time of private and silent prayer. Uh, let's say this in one voice and pray this in one voice. Lord, you oppose the proud, but give grace to the humble. Grant us a godly repentance. Prune us of our pride. Cleanse our hands and purify our hearts. We humble ourselves under your mighty hand that your power and grace might lift us up. Amen. Let's take a brief time to just come before God and to repent and confess our sins before him. Oh, Father, as we come before you, we recognize, our oh God, the, the seriousness of, of sin, of living in ways that are contrary to your word, and yet, Lord, it's your kindness that draws us to repentance. It's the good news, your grace and mercy that draws us to repentance. And so, Lord God, won't you lift us up even as we repent. Lord, give us faith, increase our faith, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, let me read for us just this gospel that we can find here in 1 Peter 2.24, but this is the gospel, the good news, the splendor and beauty of who God is, that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Amen. Um, as we partake of the Lord's Supper at this time, um, the Bible also has warnings about who should partake. Um, and, and it says those who believe in Jesus, those who trust in Jesus uh, to partake. Uh, and it's out of wisdom and prudence that we ask if you've been infant baptized and then later confirmed as an adult or you were adult baptized that you would then partake. So basically you made some sort of public profession of faith. Uh, and for those of us that, who are not able to partake, it's a great time for us to consider the splendor and beauty of who God is, about what he's done for you in Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and so I want to encourage you uh, to take time to not only think through those things, but even pray some of those thoughts to God. Um, and, and for those of us who are able to partake, um, we're going to be coming forward. Um, and just so that we can social distance properly, just if one person from each household can come forward um, to to get as many elements um, as you need for your household. And again, it's going to be like last time where it's prepackaged, where there's going to be um, the grape juice and the wafer kind of in, in, in each set. Um, and so please come up. There's going to be a table here, a table there on, on each side. Uh, I'm going to ask Elder Jimin to, to come forward um, to help. And so if, if, if you're on the right side, of me if you can come forward to where Elder Jimin is, and if you're on the left side, if you come to the left table. And please hold on to it, and we'll partake together at the end. Um, but at this time, um, I'd like to invite uh, us to come forward and, and partake of the Lord's Supper. I see the King of glory Coming on the clouds with fire the whole earth 
shakes The whole earth shakes I see his love and mercy Washing over all our sin The people sing The people sing Oh, say everyone has uh, a set, uh, this is Christ's body broken for you, That's, there's going to be a plastic film that you need to remove first uh, to get to the wafer. So let's first partake. And also Christ's blood for the forgiveness of sins shed for you. Let's now take and drink this together. And let me pray for us. Father, we, we thank you for not only your love, but Lord, how you've demonstrated your love not only once on the cross, which would have been sufficient enough, but Lord, you continue in your steadfast love to love us, Lord God, every single day. Your mercies are new, Lord God, every single morning. And so, Lord, help us to believe in this. Help us to live in light of this. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. as our worship service comes to a close, please stand and receive the blessing of the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who revealed to us the splendor, the splendor and beauty of God, and the love of God, who in Christ and through His Spirit promises to make us have splendor and beauty, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who gives us the courage and the compassion to declare the splendor and beauty to all people, be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Living faith, have a great Sunday and a great rest of the week.